Everything in life is chemistry. Your flesh and blood are made of atoms arranged into molecules, molecules into cells, cells into tissues, tissues into organs, and organs into you. The maintenance, growth, activity, everything about those cells consists of, is nothing other than, a huge variety of chemical reactions. And what makes the chemistry of life so special is how these chemical systems regulate themselves so that you make the right molecules at the right time in the right amount. That's the chemistry of life. So how do we achieve this tight control over our own chemistry? How do we manage it? We've already discussed one of the main obstacles to successful chemistry, the activation energy required to carry out any reaction. All reactions require some investment of energy to start the transformation of reactants to products. For example, I can take a match here, which should burn readily in a spontaneous chemical reaction. However, it doesn't. What does it need? It needs a little bit of activation energy. Without that activation energy, this reaction will go so slowly, it doesn't appear to be happening at all. But with a little bit of activation energy in the form of friction, the reaction starts going very quickly uh, without much of an issue. So, the big problem in chemistry of biology is that vital chemical reactions go too slowly because they require too much activation energy. Uh, they go so slowly, in fact, that many reactions in your body would take hundreds of years to produce enough product to keep you alive for a few seconds. So the big question is, how do living things reduce the required activation energy? And our answer is, living things use catalysts to reduce the activation energy of vital chemical reactions so those reactions go quickly. Now, you'll recall that the catalysts that we use to speed up our living chemistry are called enzymes. They're usually proteins, and we make them so that we can selectively speed up chemical reactions in our bodies by reducing the activation energy of those reactions. So you may remember uh, some diagrams that look like this. This is an energy diagram for a reaction. You can see that the y-axis is the Gibbs free energy. Uh, the x is time or, or process progress through the reaction. Um, if we follow the purple line, we'll see that we start off here with reactants. Uh, this purple uh, level here represents the uh, energy of the reactants to begin with, and then down here represents the energy of the product. And this hump right here, this hump right here represents the activation energy. The activation energy is a bit of additional energy which is required for the reaction to occur. Enzymes reduce this activation energy. So here the green line is representing the new pathway of the reaction. You can see here the uh, height of this bump is much smaller with the enzyme or the catalyst present. As a result of this reduction in activation energy, the reaction will go much, much faster, in some cases millions of times faster than it would without the catalyst. So, by using enzymes to lower the reaction's activation energy, we can speed up those reactions to the point where life becomes possible. Great! Uh, yet, I'm afraid we've solved one problem, but we're still left with another. This energy diagram here is for a reaction we would call exergonic, meaning it results in a net release of energy. So, uh, to put it another way, this diagram here represents a reaction that doesn't need any energy. On the contrary, this is a reaction that actually releases energy. But uh, though we've seen a number of reactions that are like this, the, the match burning is, a, is, is one example, uh, the bubbling of hydrogen peroxide when it's catalyzed by a catalyst like a manganese dioxide is another one, um, there are many reactions which are not exergonic. They don't release energy, uh, but rather they are endergonic. They require energy. Here's an energy diagram for an endergonic reaction. So you can see in an endergonic reaction, the reactants have less energy than the products. So even with an enzyme, here you can see the black or the red dotted line represents the pathway with the enzyme. Even with the enzyme present, you still need to add energy in order to make this reaction occur, in order to transform reactants into products. 
Um, so what's a good analogy for distinguishing between exergonic and endergonic processes? I like to think of boulders and mountaintops. Take a look at this boulder here up on the top of the mountain. You can imagine that if we just gave it a little nudge, it would go tumbling down the mountainside uh, spontaneously. And that's an exergonic process. And if you were in the way of that boulder, you would be, you would, it would transfer a lot of energy to you in a probably pretty unpleasant fashion. So exergonic reactions are spontaneous. They, they do need a little energy to kick them off, but then they will uh, move forward quite easily. Exergonic reactions release energy. On the other hand, if we imagine somebody trying to put that boulder back up on the hill, this is going to require a tremendous amount of energy on the part of the person. This is an endergonic reaction. An endergonic reaction needs energy to proceed. So what kinds of reactions in your body are endergonic? Well, here are some examples. The dehydration synthesis of two amino acids to make a dipeptide, that's an endergonic process. It requires energy. You can't just put together two amino acids and expect to get a dipeptide without investing additional energy. This process requires energy. The pumping of sodium ions across the membranes of your neurons in order to reset them so that they continue to fire, so that you can control your actions or think your thoughts. These are processes that require energy. You go to the gym and you try to impress somebody, so you start flexing. Well, this flexing also requires energy. Practically anything you want to do requires energy. So we've got a new problem here, and it's a big one. That's the fact that many vital reactions require energy. They are endergonic processes that will not occur unless you add energy. The big question then becomes, how do living things power these vital reactions? So a useful analogy here, I think, is the automobile. Uh, the automobile is a machine that allows us to move people and cargo very quickly along roads. Well, how does it do that? That's an endergonic process. Moving that stuff around, accelerating it up to speed, that's an endergonic process. It requires energy. Where does that energy come from? Well, the energy comes from the burning of gasoline in the engine of the car. And so the burning of the gasoline releases energy, and that energy is used to move the vehicle. You can think of an internal combustion engine as a machine that links the energy released from the combustion of gasoline to the movement of the vehicle. That's what it really is. An internal combustion engine is just a machine that links the energy released from gasoline burning to the movement of the car. And that general idea of an exergonic process, that's the gas burning, to an endergonic process, that's the moving of the car, is also what's in play when we think about living systems. We're going to be looking for exergonic processes, exergonic reactions, powering endergonic reactions. And the reaction that's of greatest interest for us is the breakdown of a molecule called ATP. So here up top we have a molecule of ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So here's the adenosine right here these two polygons and this um, squat pentagon thing looking here. This is the adenosine. And then here are one, two, three phosphates. And that's why it's called adenosine triphosphate. So adenine, adenosine triphosphate can break apart with the addition of water. It's actually a hydrolysis reaction. When it does so, it becomes uh, adenosine diphosphate. So here's the adenosine again, and then one, two phosphates. So it's therefore di instead of tri. So adenosine triphosphate plus water yields adenosine diphosphate, a phosphate molecule, that's the third, which is broken off, and, really importantly, some energy. And this energy is the energy which living cells, from humans to fungi to plants to bacteria, use to power their endergonic reactions. So let's take another look at that synthesis of amino acids to form a dipeptide. Here we have, again, an endergonic process that requires energy. In order to put these two amino acids mm -hmm. together and form a dipeptide, we need to invest energy. Now remember that the hydrolysis, or breakdown, of ATP releases energy. 
If we can link these two together, we can power the synthesis of this dipeptide. So it is the energy from the breakdown of ATP that powers the synthesis of the dipeptide. In other words, the exergonic reaction of ATP breakdown powers the endergonic reaction of dipeptide synthesis and protein synthesis generally. Remember, two amino acids doesn't make a protein. You're going to have to do this process over and over and over again, and every time you put together another amino acid, it's going to take one more molecule of ATP. Uh, and this is the case not just for protein synthesis, but also for active transport, for building up uh, all manner of different macromolecules, copying your DNA, facilitating the division of cells, really, you name it, ATP supplies the energy for it. An ATP can be thought of in a lot of ways as sort of a rechargeable molecular battery. So when it is in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, think of that as the charged battery. ATP is the charged battery. It can then give up its energy to power some cellular work, some endergonic process in the cell, and become ADP and a phosphate molecule. Think of ADP and the phosphate as the uncharged or depleted battery. These are rechargeable batteries, so we can recharge them, and if you supply energy in the right way, you can take this ADP and phosphate, this depleted battery, and recharge it back into ATP. Uh, and you do this on a daily basis. I believe the figure is something like your whole body weight in ATP is consumed every day, and that much is also recharged or regenerated. So we've got uh, at least partially an answer to the question of how do living things power their endergonic processes. So remember, our big problem was many vital reactions require energy. They're endergonic. The question is, how do living things power their vital reactions? And the answer we have now is that living things power their vital reactions with the energy that is released from the breakdown of ATP. But where does the energy come from that recharges ATP? How is ATP recharged? Now, in order to answer this question, we've got to take a look at a living cell. So let's zoom in together on a uh, living cell. OK, here we are. Uh, we've got here a, uh, a large cell. Here's the cell membrane. And here's a mitochondrion. So what you'll notice about the mitochondrion is that there are actually two membranes. So there's this outer membrane here, and then there's this inner squiggly membrane. Uh, this space between the two membranes we call the intermembrane compartment, and this space in the middle, shaded in pink here, we call the matrix, or the mitochondrial matrix. So from the inside out, we have the mitochondrial matrix, the inner mitochondrial membrane, the intermembrane compartment or intermembrane space, and then the outer mitochondrial membrane. And where we're going to go right now is the inner mitochondrial membrane, maybe somewhere like here. That's where we're going to zoom in. If we zoom in there, we'll find a ton of proteins. Inner mitochondrial membranes are, are some of the most protein-rich membranes in the cell. And uh, we'll find uh, a huge concentration of them and in particular, if we're interested in recharging ATP, uh, we'll want to focus on a protein uh, that looks like this one over here. So this protein is called ATP synthase, and it's a really well-named protein because what ATP synthase does is it synthesizes or makes ATP. So draw your attention to the bottom here. This area is called the catalytic knob the catalytic knob of ATP synthase. And what you'll see is happening is ADP and phosphate bind to a site, and then there's some rotation that occurs, and the ADP and phosphate are combined to form ATP, which is then ejected. More ADP and phosphate binds. That ADP and phosphate is recombined into ATP. The catalytic knob on ATP synthase is where ADP and phosphate that depleted battery is recharged into ATP, which can then go and power all kinds of endergonic processes, energy requiring processes in your cell. So how does the catalytic knob get the energy to recharge the battery? Well, the energy comes from the rotation of this rod here. And the rotation of this rod here comes from the rotation of this wheel up here. And so you might consider the analogy of a water wheel. 
So a water wheel will always sit in some river or brook or something, and it'll have these big paddles that sit in the water. And as the water flows by, it will push the paddles up and the water wheel will spin. It'll turn some mechanism, some machinery uh, attached to the water wheel, and this will allow you to saw wood or grind corn or whatever that machine is, is meant to do. So the flow of water powers the water wheel, the water wheel powers the machinery. That's basically what's going on here. Except instead of a flow of water, we have a flow of protons. So what happens here is our protons, or hydrogen ions, they're the same thing, will flow through the ATP synthase, and as they flow through, they'll cause this region up here, this rotor, to spin. And as this rotor spins, uh, that will result in a spinning of this shaft down here within the catalytic knob, and that rotation is what provides the energy to recharge the ATP. What we're looking at here is basically a, a little molecular scale generator where the output is recharged ATP. So this is it. We had a big problem that we started with, and that was how do cells, uh, how do living things generally provide the energy for all those reactions that require it? And we said, well, uh, they use ATP the breakdown of ATP to power those reactions. And then we said, well, how, how does ATP get recharged? And here's your answer to that question. The flow of protons from one side of the membrane to the other powers the spinning of this rotor. The spinning of this rotor powers the spinning of this shaft. The spinning of this shaft powers the reaction which combines ADP and phosphate into ATP. So are we done? Have we solved the problem of energy in living things? <laughs> Absolutely not. We've got a big question still remaining, and that is, if what spins this wheel and powers the whole thing is uh, having a lot of protons up here so that they'll flow through, that must mean there's a high concentration of protons up here. And if that's the case, energy must have been used to put those protons up here. So we haven't really answered the energy question yet. We've just kicked the can down the road. So next time, we need to answer this question. How does this high concentration of protons form so that we can spin the wheel to spin the shaft to make the ATP to power the energy requiring reactions in the cell? We'll take a look at that next time. Next time, the electron transport chain. See you then.